We've been encouraged, we've been inspired, but we know what we really need is to be transformed. Start with me, but encapsulate us all, and we will give and pay homage to the Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you audit a course in college, what you are saying is, I want the information without the responsibility. I want to learn whatever the course is seeking to teach, but don't give me homework and don't give me exams. I don't want the work of it, I just want the knowledge about it. You may be able to do that with college, but you cannot do that with the Christian life. You cannot audit it. What many people do is they come to church to hear the word, to be inspired by the word, but who don't plan to do any of the work. They don't want to incur any of the responsibility of it, but they like the learning about it. Well, in college, you need to know that when you audit a course, you don't get credit for it because you didn't put in what the course required. And when you audit the Christian life by coming to hear the word, to be inspired and encouraged by the word, but to not act on the word that you've heard, you may have more knowledge and you may be more inspired, but you won't be changed. Because the transformation in the life through the word has to be activated by obedience. Without that, it becomes information with no credit. That is no transforming value. We're now at the sixth church that the Apostle John has written, the church at Philadelphia. This is the first Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This Philadelphia, in verse 7 of Revelation 3, is located some 30 miles southeast of Sardis, a great commercial city with a major trade route plagued often with earthquakes. That was the nature of this city. Inside this city, was a small church, a small gathering of believers, Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. This small gathering of believers found themselves in this pagan realm, and Jesus, who is the spokesperson through the shepherd of each one of these churches, speaks through this leader to the saints at Philadelphia Bible Fellowship at the church in Philadelphia and notice what he says verse 7 he who is holy who is true who has the key of David who opens and no one will shut and who shuts and no one opens says this so before we get into all the idiosyncrasies of what he has to say to this church he wants to give another description of himself which he has done in each of these churches and he describes himself as he who is holy and true. Holy means to be set apart as unique, special, or one of a kind. Holy means you're not be, to be put in a class with anything else. I describe holy often in using the difference between dishes in the sink, dishes in the kitchen, and dishes in the dining room. The dishes in the sink are dirty. They are dirty dishes. That's why they're in the sink. The dishes in the kitchen are common dishes. You use that for all of your meals. But the dishes in the den, well, they got their own room. They got their own glass case because they are special. They're not integrated with the common, and they're certainly not integrated with the profane, the dirty. No, they're in a, that, that's special. They come out on special occasions. Jesus says, don't put me in a room with anybody else. Don't, don't make me another one of the people you recognize. I'm not just a good person. I'm not just a great prophet. I am holy. 
I am separate. I am one of a kind. I am unique. I'm in a class by myself. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, the Bible says God is holy. So when Jesus declares himself to be holy, he declares himself to be God. So we're not just talking about another name or one of the crowd. He says, uh, I am unique, and therefore must be viewed and treated uniquely. I am not only holy, I am also true. Truth has to do with ultimate reality. I'm the real deal. Anything that contradicts me is false and is a lie and cannot be trusted. So you are to measure everything by the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So everything is to be measured by its inconsistency and compatibility to me. And if it's incompatible and inconsistent with me, it's wrong no matter who told it to you, how long you believed it, and how well you know it. I am truth. I am holy and true. Not only am I unique and set apart, not only am I ultimate reality, but now he gets to the nitty gritty. He says, I have the key of David. I have the key of David. Now, to appreciate what he's talking about, this is drawn from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25. In Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25, the steward of the house of David, the kingdom, house of David, David was the, was the king of Israel, it uses that to speak of the kingdom, the key belonged to this steward, but the steward did not do the right job. So he was uh, fired. And when he was fired, a new steward replaced him. This new steward was Eliakim, and Eliakim was given the key to the kingdom. Not given a key, he was given the key. Jesus says, I possess the key of the king of David, of the kingdom of David. That is, I have the kingdom key. Notice it's a single key because it's a master key. Anybody who possesses a master key can get any, in any door. All the doors are available to him because he has a master key. So when the Bible speaks of the key, it speaks of two things, access and authority. So Jesus claims access to any door and authority over every door. Let me say that again. Jesus, the one with the key, the master key, has access to every door, which is what a master key gives you, and authority over every door, which is why he says he can open the doors he wants to open and lock the doors he wants to stay locked because he is in charge. Now, if you and I don't get that, we're going to think people are in charge. We're going to think power brokers are in charge. We're going to think folk with money are in charge. We're going to think folk with clout are in charge. They may have a key, they don't have a master key. They may have a key to a door, they don't have a key to every door. Jesus says, I control the kingdom because I have control of the master key. Or as he says in Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, all authority has been given to me, not only in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. He says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Oh, to put it in everyday language, I got the key, so I'm in charge. I run the show. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, he says, I'm going to build my church, and I will give my church the keys to the kingdom. Watch this now. Jesus says, I have the master key. That's one key that can lock any door. But I'm going to give to my people, the church, I'm going to give them the keys, plural, to the kingdom. So what he's given us is multiple keys to multiple doors while he possesses the master key to every door. So he has the key, we have the keys. How does it work? When you use the right key, he'll back it up with the master key. But when you use the wrong key, the master key can't back you up because the master key can only be consistent with the keys that he's given us. Let me put it another way. If you skip God's way to get it done, whatever it is you're trying to get done, then don't just call on God to use his master key when you've ignored the key he gave you. 
He does not want you to skip the responsibility he's given you and simply call on him because he got the master key. He wants to know your keys are consistent with his key. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, what is that? It's authority. I'm going to share my authority with you when you are consistent with me. Authority, kingdom, means to rule. So God wants to rule, not only in heaven, but in history, through the person of Jesus Christ, and he possesses the key. See, the reason why we are not seeing more of the master key is because God is not seeing more of the use of us using the right key. See, we go and use the world's key to unlock heaven. Those keys don't fit in that lock. I shared with you before how I was in New York and I was at the Marriott Hotel and I checked out, caught a plane to Chicago, got into the Hilton Hotel, went up 35 floors in the dead of winter with my luggage, freezing outside. I put my key in the lock, click, click, red light, click, click, red light, click, click, red light. So I'm a little ticked off now because I didn't go on up 35 floors. It's cold outside. I catch the elevator down. I go to the registration desk. I say, excuse me, this key doesn't work. He said, because that key doesn't go to this hotel. <laughs> I had forgotten to throw away my Marriott key and was using a Marriott key in a Hilton lock and those kingdoms don't fit. You know, those, those, those kingdoms, those, those keys don't fit when you mix in kingdoms. And what Christians do is they mix kingdoms and wonder why heaven's door won't open. Because God won't use the king key if you won't use your key. Your key must be consistent with his master key. And he says when God moves, when Jesus moves specifically, he opens and closes doors. And he says when he moves with his key, that is with his divine authority. He says when he does that, nobody can shut it. Okay, this ought to do something to your gizzard. Right there, right there, right there. Let me tell you what I ought to do with your gizzard. What this means is when you're using God's keys, people do not have the last say-so. Mm, see that? See, we get all shook up about people. Oh, he got the power to let me in or to lock me out. He got the power to raise me or to put me down. He's got the power. She's got the power to fire me or hire me. They got the power. They got all the power. Jesus said, but I got the master key. And when I open the door, I don't care who they are, where they come from, how much they have, what degrees they possess. When I have the key, if I decide to open that door, nobody going to shut a door I open. And if I decide to lock them up, they're not going to be able to get back in because I'm in charge here. I've got the key to the kingdom. See, we fear the wrong folk. We fear folk because they got a name. We fear folk because they got some money. We fear folk because they got some power but you are related to the one who's got the key of David. Ultimate authority. Final say so. So he's, you know, you, you ever been into a prison to, to, for one reason or another? <laughs> you know, they got these pods now, these elevated pods where the, the gods sit. And they, they got all these keys to let folk in or to block folks out. The world wants to hold you hostage and Jesus says, but I got the key to every cell. I got the key to every door. So it's the one with the key who determines it. And if, if you don't get that and if I don't get that, we'll run around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to get folk to do what folk may or may not be willing to do when you're supposed to know the one who's got the master key to any door that you have to deal with. Yeah, we got to understand who we're dealing with here. He says, I possess the keys. So what's the problem? He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. 
Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Oh, watch it. In order for his key to work, for you, for me, and for his church, he says, you must have kept my word, obeyed me, and not denied my name. So one of the reasons many believers are not seeing God come through is because they do not keep his word. They, they come to church and hear it, but they do not keep his word and or they deny his name. They don't want to be publicly associated with him. He says to them, you have little power. That means this is a small church that doesn't have big names, doesn't have notoriety people, doesn't have highly educated folk, doesn't have a bunch of rich, rich saints sitting in the sanctuary. He says, you have little power. You not all that in a bag of chips. People don't know who you are. They don't appreciate who you are. They don't respect who you are. You don't have what people view as substantive, significant, and worth applauding. But he says, I have set before you an open door. Even though folks say you are a nothing and a nobody, I have set before you an open door. And when I open this bad boy up for you, the folk with the name, with the money, and with the power will not be able to shut it. But the way I will open the door and the reason I will open the door for you, your life, your world, and your ministry is because you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. See, we got folk wanting to God open doors when they, while they disobey him. We got folk wanting God to open doors while they are ashamed to bear his name. Notice, you can't deny his name. You can talk about God all you want. You can talk about God this and God that. That's not his name. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, not this generic God. No, no, no. Yeah, God is there, but God has bequeathed or delegated everything to his son. It is at the name of Jesus every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So if folk don't know your relationship to Jesus, you have denied his name, even though you may be talking about God bless you all day long. You have not denied my name. Jesus says, when you deny me on earth, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. When you confess me on earth, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So if you are ashamed of Jesus Christ and don't want to be publicly associated with him, forget open doors. You can open your own door. And that's why we get so messed up because we're around here trying to get folk to open up the door, create the opportunity, make the connection, give us the money, and we're doing all this to open up doors and Jesus is sitting there with a master key. And, and, and if you've never seen God give you an open door, you see, you'd have missed something. If, 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 if you've never seen God swing something open that looked like it was closed. And see, if you've never seen him come through when there was no way, Jose, if, if you've never seen him intervene in your circumstances, then you have not experienced the authority of Christ to overrule particularly if you were of little power. Now, you didn't have the wherewithal. You didn't have the contacts. You didn't have the money. You didn't have the education. You didn't have the notoriety, but you had him. Sometimes around the church, people I don't know will, 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 will be around and, and maybe the custodial staff is not around and they need to get into some place legitimately. And they're running to me. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know their name. I'm not familiar with them well, just because of the number of people. And they'll say, Well, Pastor, can I get can I get in this room to do something legitimate, whatever it is? 
well, I got a master key. I got a master key. And, and even though they're unknown, they know me. So even though they're unknown and it's legitimate and they know me, because I got a master key, I can open up a door. When other folk aren't around, I can open up a door. Jesus says, folk may not know who you are, but you know him. You confess him. You obey him. He got a master key. And nothing will make the Lord more real to you than he, when he opens things up, you were too powerless to open up on your own because you had little power, little notoriety, little name recognition. See, that's why the, the greatest people in our congregation are not necessarily the people with masters and doctorate degrees. Not necessarily the folks with Mercedes and, and Benzes and, and Lincolns and what have you. It's not, no, it's not necessarily the folk who, who got the six-figure-plus incomes. Nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, but, but you have to need to know the most powerful people are people of little power who know him and who advertise his name because they have access to a master key. Now, the, the upscale folk can do that too, but he says, you have little power, but you have access to me. That's why um, I would suggest for me and for us, no matter what position you hold, money you have, or influence you will, keep yourself small. Okay. Folk may be whispering in your ear, oh, you all that, and a bag of chips. Don't believe it. You better keep yourself small in the eyes of God. Pride cometh before the fall. You better keep yourself small. Don't, don't think you all that. Because uh, pride cometh before the fall, and, and, and you need to understand that uh, humility is a big deal to God. That you, you, you don't view yourself that way. Now, other folk may be right you out, but, 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 but how you think about you, you better keep yourself small because Jesus says, even though you have little power, I'm going to open up a door for you because you have obeyed me and you have uh, not denied my name. If God has blessed you, praise God. If God has given you a great job, bless God. If God has given you a big house, bless God. If God has given you a nice car, bless God. If God has given you great clothes, bless God. Just so long as you know, you know better than the widow on fixed income because God will open doors for those with little power. So it's okay if we're blessed, just don't become elite. Don't become, don't become big-headed. Think, think you all that. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh -uh. On, on our best day, when we've been blessed the best, <laughs> you are a sinner saved by grace. That's on your best day. I'm a sinner saved by grace on my best day. Don't you ever forget that. Because if you never forget that, then you don't look down on people who don't have your education, your money, your job, your career, your house. You don't look down on anybody because you may be looking down on somebody who has access to a master key. Says so you have little power, but I have opened up a door. And I've opened up a door for two reasons. You obey me and you don't deny me. See, because when you, when you get a lot of power, then you get self-sufficient. You know, we, we have this tendency, we all do, to get self-sufficient. I can make it on my own. I got Visa and MasterCard, American Express. I can, I can make it on my own. I know people. Okay? If you know Jesus Christ, you know somebody. Okay? You know people. And he says, and I open the door and nobody will shut a door I open. I don't care what their name is and how much power they wield and how much money they have. 
He says in verse 9, Behold, I've, you have kept the word of my perseverance, and I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour that is about to come upon the whole world. He told him in verse 9, Behold, I've caused those in the sanctuary synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Whoa. <laughs> he said, all those false folk out there, synagogue of Satan, they, they go to church, synagogue, but they're of the devil. Because just because just you're in church, synagogue, doesn't mean you of the Lord. There is a synagogue of Satan. All right? So, so the religious talk doesn't mean a thing. He says, but I'm going to let them know that I have loved you. Even though you got a little power, I'm going to let them know you got more power than you look like you have. Maybe you remember the story about a big dog and little puppy. German Shepherd and a poodle. German Shepherd and a Poodle were standing at a door, were standing at a door, and Big Dog, the, sh the shepherd, looked at the pudel, uh, Poodle and said, you, you little puppy, you can't, you, 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 you can't do much. Look how small you are. Look how short you are. You know, you, 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 you got that little, 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 little girl bark. <laughs> I'm Big Dog. <laughs> I'm big Dog. Say, look, look at this door. I wonder how long it would take you to get open this door because I can open this door. I can open this door quickly because I'm big and, and I can reach the knob. You can't even reach the knob. In fact, let's have a contest. Let's see who can open the door the quickest. Little puppy said, okay, you, you go first, big dog. <laughs> big dog, you go first. German shepherd jumped up on the door, got his mouth around the knob. <laughs> And put his put his put his mouth all around the knob and started twisting at the knob. And after about two and a half minutes of working the knob, he got the door open. And then he pulled his shut and he said, "Beat that, a little puppy, because big dog didn't show you. You can't even reach the knob. Your turn." Little puppy came up to the door, gave a small bark, <laughs> scratched the door. The man on the inside came and opened it. Because see, when you know who's on the inside, you ain't got to go through all that. <laughs> bother you if you're a little puppy because if you know the Lord he's got the key and he can open up what the big dogs can't help you with he said you got you got the synagogue of Satan and they messing with you uh, they calling you holier than thou they think they think they 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 say, oh, you one of them Bible people, and you 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 got you bring up Jesus all the time, and you go you one of them, and yeah, they can make you feel bad. He says, and the synagogue of Satan is making it tough for you, but I can keep watch this, I can keep you from the hour of testing. He calls it you in a test. Watch this. So if you're in a situation and the door has not yet opened, he says, consider it a test, and he says, and I'm gonna walk you through the test. Until I reverse it. He says, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Ooh. Nothing makes God real than when he reverses the irreversible. Nothing makes God more real than when he flips something that looked unflippable. Nothing made God so powerful to you when there was no way out. You were trapped. The devil was looked like he was running the whole show. And then he reverses it. But you may say, but, but I don't see him doing anything. Oh, yeah, well, look at the next verse. He says, you're going through this test, and I'm going to keep you through this hour, but I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that none, no one will take your crown. 
oh, I love this word, I am coming quickly. That means suddenly. That means unexpectedly. That means out of nowhere. See, when God is silent, that doesn't mean he's still. I know you don't see him doing anything. I know it looks like you're just waiting for nothing. But God likes to come in suddenly. He likes to break in when you didn't expect it, when you didn't think there was any way that this thing could ever get better, that this trial could ever end. He loves to do something suddenly. And the reason why he likes to do things quickly or suddenly is so that when it happens, there is no debate on who caused it to take place. Because it, it came out of nowhere. Quickly. You wonder, whoo, where did that come from? And it becomes inextricably clear that this was heaven invading history because God wants to join a favorite R&B group so that when you have seen him come through suddenly, you can start singing that song. Didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? He wants to blow your mind. And so, boom, he comes through suddenly. He says, and I will come quickly. So don't worry about it. If you don't have all the degrees and if you don't have all the money and you don't have all the prestige and you don't have all the power and people don't applaud you when you walk into the room, don't worry about it. Just obey him. Don't deny his name. And then wait for the Lord, I say. Wait upon the Lord. Because he comes suddenly. And once you have this perspective, you're free. Because you know them people don't have the last say. <laughs> they have a say, they don't have the say. Yeah, they, 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 they look like they're running the show until God swoops in on them and changes them or changes their mind or changes you or changes the circumstances. It's like... It's like that time the, the folks, when we were getting our church, the folks told us we couldn't meet in the school anymore. We didn't have a place to go. They were going to vote whether they were going to let us stay or to put us out. God caused there to be an accident on the freeway so the people who were going to vote against us who were riding in the same car couldn't get off the off-ramp. And when the council couldn't wait for them any longer, they voted without them. We won five to four. As soon as the vote was over, they came rushing in. It was too late. Because God over, over, overturned that thing. And if, you, if you've never seen God do that, if you don't know what God can do, then, you, then you're, just living, you're just living with based on what man can do. And men do not have the final say so. And that's, why, that's why you're free. <laughs> you're free. You're free. People don't get the final word because they don't have the master key to your life, to your world, to your family. They don't, they don't control it. He says, I have the master key. That must be your perspective. Perspective is everything. It's like the Montana, Montana put out a thing for catching wolves, and they were, they were going to pay $5,000 for any trapper who caught a wolf, $5,000 per wolf. Sam and Jed decided to go wolf hunting then because that's $5,000 a wolf. So they went wolf hunting in Montana. They put up their tent. They got in their tent because the next day they were going to hunt for some wolves to get $5,000 a wolf. They go to sleep. Jed wakes up first in the morning. When Jed wakes up, there are 50 wolves, hungry wolves, surrounding their tent with blood red eyes eyes with, with saliva dripping down the side of their mouth with them growling and those sharp teeth 50, 50 wolves right there at their tent, hungry wolves Jeb woke up Sam, said Sam Sam, get up Sam said what? Jeb said, we're rich <laughs> see it all depends on your perspective, it, it all depends on how you see things I know the devil may be nipping at you. The synagogue of Satan may be nipping at you. But when you've got God's perspective, it changes what you're looking at. And so, I'm coming quickly. I'm going to come suddenly. 
So what does he tell you to do in verse 11? Hold fast. Hold fast. Don't, I know you want to give up. I know you want to quit. I know you're tired. He says, hold fast. Make sure you're obeying and not denying. You do. You hold fast to your obedience and non-denial. And at his time, suddenly. Don't let them take your crown. That's the right to rule. Even small folk have been called to rule. And now he gives us his final statement. He who overcomes. Overcomes what? The tendency to give up. He who overcomes the tendencies to stop obeying and to stop denying. He who overcomes that and says, God, as the old folks say, I'm going to hold on until my change come. You know, it's rough, it's tough, but I believe you and not my circumstances as the final arbiter of my situation. He says, you hold on. He who overcomes, look at this, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. You see the word, that word, name, 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 name. First of all, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar. A pillar, it holds a building up. I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. A temple is God's house. The pillars are located in God's house. Galatians 2.9 says that Peter, James, and John were the pillar of the church. They were, they were holding up the church. In other words, he speaks of these people who overcome the, the propensity to give up as being in closest proximity to God. And he says for these folk who are overcomers and who are in close proximity to God, they will have a name. And he keeps saying name, 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 name in that in verse in verse uh, twelve over and over again. He keeps talking about name of this and name of that, name of this and name of that. He says you will have a name in the New Jerusalem. Let's get something straight. Everybody is not equal in heaven. Okay, let's get it straight. Okay, you can have a forty watt bulb a 60-watt bulb, a 75-watt bulb in your house, a 100-watt bulb in your house, a 150-watt bulb in your house. Now, all of them are bulbs, and all of them will light to their capacity, but everybody's capacity isn't the same. A 40-watt can't give you 100 watts because it's not established to be able to produce like that. Well, all Christians are Christians, but they don't have the same watts, and so they don't exude the same experience because they don't have the same relationship. Jesus said in St. John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25 it says many believed on him. Many believed on him but he would not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. They got saved but they had not yet got committed. They were on their way to heaven, but he couldn't use them on earth. They were forgiven for their sins, but they didn't want folk to know that they were Christians. They went to church, but they wouldn't obey the word. So they believed in him, but he would make no commitment to them. There are a lot of Christians who Jesus is just not deeply committed to in a practical way because they want to be 40 watt Christians expecting a 100 watt blessing and it doesn't work that way. He wants to know that you're all in, that you're a full time Christian, not a part time saint. He wants to know that you will not deny him and that you will obey what he has commanded. And he says to that one, I will give him a name. You know, when, you, when people go to the cowboy game and they go to the cowboy game, there are folks who are sitting in the stands. We don't know their name. Now they're in the location, but we don't know their name. In fact, that's the majority of the folk who are in the building. The majority of the folk in the building are in the stands, and they're just part of the crowd, and we don't know their names. Now, when it comes to the players, we know their names kind of, sort of, because if I were to ask you to name the name of the right God, many of you couldn't do that. If I ask you to name the name of the punter, many of you couldn't do that because even though they have a name because they're on the team, you may not know the name because of the position that they play.
But now when we upgrade and start talking about wide receivers and quarterbacks and running backs, well, you know those names because those names have achieved a greater name in publicity because of the role they play on the team. But then, not only do you have the folk in the crowd and uh, the folks on the team, some more nameless than others, some with a higher name, you got the ring of honor. In the ring of honor, those are folk who've made a name. You see, the players come and go, but the folks in the ring of honor stay there because over time, they held fast. Over time, they played the game. Over time, they didn't quit when they were injured. Over time, they stayed committed to the task. In fact, their name is not only in the ring of honor, their name is in Canton, Ohio, in a bust in the Canton Hall of Fame. So that generation after generation will know who their name was. God has a lot of Christians. In fact, Old Cliff has a lot of Christians that are in the stands. They just show up to watch the game. All they want to see is what the choir is singing and what the preacher is preaching, and they just come for the show. Now, folk in the crowd, don't get dirty, don't incur responsibility, don't get knocked down, don't get blocked, don't get tackled, because they're not there to participate. They're just there to watch the show. But then there are some folk in the kingdom of God and at Oak Cliff who don't want to just stay in the stands, they want to get on the field. They serve in ministry. They help other people. They give to the advancement of the cause of the Lord. And then you got some superstars. Those are the ring of honors. Oh, it's not just the folk who's people who you know their name. It's folk who are the unknown folk, but you can count on them. You can depend on them because they are forever holding their role, loving the Lord, serving the saints, giving to the Lord, and giving glory in their witness for the Lord. So I want to challenge you today. If you want God to put you in the ring of honor, if you want when he hears you and sees you to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, if you want him to call you out of the crowd and let all of heaven know you're one of his choicest servants, I challenge you to leave the stands, to come on the field. Now, I want to tell you the truth. You're going to get blocked a little bit on the field. You're going to get tackled a little bit on the field. But when they start handing out Super Bowl rings, you're going to get a Super Bowl ring because you were a Super Bowl saint. So let's get busy glorifying the Lord, obeying the Lord, not denying the Lord. Because if you are an obedient saint who does not deny him, you are an overcomer. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we need you today at a level that that is beyond the ordinary. We need the supernatural extraordinary now because you have allowed it to be clear <laughs> that we have human limitations. So we cry out to you, Lord, for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, starting in this house and then where you take us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every four years, there are the Olympics where the elite athletes of the world come together to compete. They have worked hard to be viewed and understood and seen as the very best of the best. And so they come and they compete against other athletes from other countries, aspiring ultimately for the gold medal, the ultimate recognition of their superiority. However, when the gold medalist stands on the platform to receive the gold medal, they do not ask him or her what's their favorite song. They play the national anthem of the country of which, of which they are a part with their flag flying high because it is understood while that athlete 
use their talents and their skills and their efforts and their hard work, they represent a bigger country. They represent a bigger kingdom. It's not just about them. It includes them, it utilizes them, but it's bigger than them. And so they want it to be made clear that they did this under the banner and under the flag of the kingdom that they represent. God has a kingdom. It's made up of citizens, some black, some white, some red, yellow, Spanish backgrounds. And his intention was never that their individual uniquenesses would ever cause them to lose sight of the flag flying over them, the flag of the cross and the flag of our commitment to Christ. America, in particular, is reaching an all-time low in this issue of race and culture and class. Just under the surface, there's this ever-bubbling problem that has gone unresolved. This sinful, evil disease of racism, culturalism, and classism is too deep for over-the-counter remedies. Radical surgery is needed. Any, any sickness that lasts this long and run this deep, Walgreens is insufficient for. CVS cannot give you an antidote. We need something more radical and much deeper to address this chaotic confusion in the culture. So as clearly as I know how, I would like to spend my time with you this morning to as specifically as possible address this issue of race, of culture, of class that has been muddied by a million different voices. We've got voices about which life matters. All life is created in the image of God. All life is created in the image of God, therefore all lives matter. However, underneath the banner that God has created all people in his image, there are equities that must be addressed. For example, the life of the unborn matters. And so there is this emphasis on injustice in the womb. But that injustice in the womb must be under the umbrella that that is life. And because all life matters, that life matters. Black lives matter as a subset of all lives matter. So any injustices to a particular group must be addressed specific to that group but under the banner that all life is created in the image of God. And so on and so forth. But once you extract any specific scenario and remove it from the umbrella of God's creation, you create your own independent cause. There is no discussion of sociology that at least from a Christian point of view that should not be plugged into theology. That is God's view about it. So I'm going to seek today to give you God's view of race culture and class because the principles can apply to any one of those areas so that when you leave here you have a better view of you 
and you have a helpful understanding bibliocentrically of how to help others to look at this from God's point of view. Now, let's make it clear, if people do not start with God, they're not going to stay with you. So, so we're going to make that clear. If, they're not, if, they, if they reject that, they will reject you, but the Bible says that is to be expected. That if they rejected me, they're going to reject you if you bring me into the equation. But what he does not want you to do is leave him out just because they don't bring him in. And so I must speak to this issue from a theocentric, Christocentric, and bibliocentric perspective. God, Christ, and Scripture. In John chapter 4, We have a definitive statement on this issue coming out of an event that took place in Jesus' life. Jesus has become popular. We're told in verse 1, he's now baptizing more people than John, and it has become clear he is emerging. And people are beginning to see that this was no ordinary man or prophet but Jesus is not yet ready to make his full public declaration of who he is, the eternal son of God. And so he leaves Judea and goes to Galilee, but we're told in verse 4 he had to pass through Samaria. A little geography. Judea is in the south, Galilee is in the north, and right between Judea and Galilee is Samaria, so it was part of the direct route. But the reason John puts it here is because no Orthodox Jew had to pass through Samaria because in Samaria lived the Samaritan dogs. That's what they were called by Jews, the unclean ones. A little bit of history. In 722 BC, Assyria invaded Israel as part of God's judgment they took many of the Jews back to Assyria and transplanted some Assyrians into Israel so there was interracial marriage. The interracial marriages created this new group of people called the Samaritans who were despised, as you'll see in a moment, by the Jews because of this interbreeding racially. And so they wouldn't deal with the Samaritans because they were half-breeds and they were unclean and so they, they wouldn't have anything to do with them. But the Bible says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. The reason he had to pass through, through Samaria is because at 12 o'clock noon, or as the scripture says, the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock, there's a woman coming to the well. We're told in verse 5, and so he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Notice a lot of attention is given to this well. We're not just totally stopped by a well. We're the well is described. This is... Jacob's well that he gave to his son Joseph located in the vicinity of Sychar, which was the city of Samaria. He, he wants us to know that this is not an ordinary well. This is a Jacob given to his son well. Why would that be important for the author of John, John the Apostle, to tell us that? Well, in a moment you'll see the Jews didn't get along with the Samaritans and the Samaritans didn't get along with the Jews, but they both loved Jacob. For Jacob was the father of the Jews and the Samaritans. Of course, of the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also of the Samaritans because the Samaritans accepted the first five books of the Bible. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Jacob is in the first book of the Bible. Since they accepted the first book of the Bible, they accepted Jacob. So in order to make this thing work, Jesus met her on common ground. He met her at a place of agreement. 
And their place of agreement was scriptural related because they were both related to Jacob. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews, but they both loved them some Jacob. And so he met her at a place that they could both agree on. He meets her there, and we find out that he wants a drink of water from her cup. You've got to be kidding me. You're going to put your Jewish lips to this woman's Samaritan cup? Now, we know it's a shocker because look at verse 9. Verse 9 tells us, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, before I go on, I want to call your attention to verse 8. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Probably chicken. <laughs> because they were all preachers. <laughs> so they've gone into the city to buy food, and he just drops that in and then goes back to the story because that's going to become a critical part of the story in just a moment that they're in town buying food. The Samaritan woman looks at Jesus after Jesus is offering to drink from her cup and she is shocked, stupefied, mesmerized. She, she can't figure out, you being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water. Why is this important? Question number one. How did she know he was a Jew? He never identifies himself as a Jew. He never says that he's a Jew. So evidently, he's obviously a Jew. Just by looking at him, seeing his dress, hearing his accent, because all she does is see him and hear him, he's obviously Jewish. So recognizing he's a Jew, she's shocked. In other words, Jesus didn't stop being who he was to reach somebody else. He didn't go to Samaria and find out how to speak Samaritan and then find out how they dress so I can dress like them in order to hide who he was. He was visibly, verbally a Jew. And it was evident. So he didn't give up his own creation to talk to a different kind of creation. He was able to maintain his racial and cultural identity. But even though he maintained his racial and cultural identity, he didn't let it get in the way of doing what his father had called him to do. And that is to reach across the railroad tracks to somebody who was different than him who the rest of his culture would not reach out to. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. While God is not calling any of us to give up how he made us, he is not expecting us to use how he made us to relate inappropriately to people he has made different than us. God is not asking you to be anything other than what he's made you as long as you submit to how he has made you to how you relate to other people who he has made different than you. It is technically incorrect, technically, to call yourself a black Christian or a white Christian or a Hispanic Christian because then you make your color or your culture an adjective. It's the job of an adjective to modify a noun. So if you put Christianity in the noun position and your color or culture in the adjectival position, you have to keep shaping the noun so that it looks like the adjective that describes it. So if your color or culture stays in the adjectival position, you got to keep shaping Christianity to look black or to look white or to look red or to look yellow because that's the adjectival description you've given it. Your Christianity must always be in the adjectival position 
your color and culture must always be in the noun position so that if anything must be adjusted, it is the noun of your humanity and not the adjective of your faith. You and I are to define our, our humanity in terms of our faith, not our faith in terms of our humanity. Jesus stayed who he was, but he operated from heaven's point of view. He didn't give up being a Jew to reach her. God is not asking you to give up who you are to touch somebody else. But don't let the fact that all them other folk in your race won't drink from a cup to keep you from drinking from a cup. Don't be so committed to your own race that you operate outside of the Christian faith. while staying true to what God has made you. And so Jesus Christ says, can I have a, a drink of your water? The woman, is, the woman is overwhelmed because he's doing something no Jew does. He's doing something that his people don't do. And this has been going on since 722 BC. So this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so she is awed by the fact that he's going to put his Jewish lips to my Samaritan cup. Now, please notice something. He hadn't given her any Bible yet. He hadn't preached to her yet. He hadn't witnessed to her yet. He hadn't, he hadn't given her theology yet. She doesn't even know who he is. All she knows is he's a nice man. That's all she knows. See, a lot of folk want to tell folk about Jesus who are not willing to drink out of the cup. I want to get your soul to heaven. I just don't want to deal with you on earth. I'll witness to you, but I won't eat with you. I'll witness to you, but I won't drink with you. I'll talk about God. Jesus hasn't even talked about who he is yet. But he demonstrated by his touch and by his, soci his sociology gave validity to the theology that was to come. And a lot of folk have rejected God because how can I believe in a God who, who's not social enough for you to sit down and eat and drink and fellowship with me because I'm a Samaritan, because I'm of a different history and background and race and culture. So the woman is just shocked just because he's going to put his Jewish lips to her Samaritan cup. He's going to do what his own race won't because it was the right thing to do. So, Jesus tells her, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who you were talking to, who said, give, you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. A little transition to the spiritual. He'd have given you living water. Everyone who drinks your water, verse 13, is going to thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him will become a well springing up to eternal life. Hmm. The woman says, well, shucks, I want that water. I don't have to come out here at 12 o'clock every day and do this, do this well thing if you're going to do that. What is this living water? I don't know where you're going with it. What is this? Well, he says to her, go call your husband. Okay, now he didn't go on from drinking water to who she's sleeping with. He didn't go on from drinking water, he's all up in her boudoir. He's all up, he's all up in her business. He's all up in her stuff. Go call your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you got that right, verse 17. <laughs> you have correctly said, because you've had five husbands and the one you have now is Mr. Jones, me and Mr. Jones. He's, the one you have now is not your husband. This you have truly said. He confronts her with her sinfulness, her looseness, her improprieties. He could have never gotten that far if he wasn't willing to drink from her cup. 
but his sociology opened up an opportunity for theology. She said, sir, verse 19, I perceive you are a prophet. I guess so. <laughs> he, he's all up in your stuff like that. He knows about your life, just having met you. I perceive you are a prophet. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, verse 20, and you people. <laughs> a racial slur if I ever heard one, you people. <laughs> Say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Jesus says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming and now... Neither in this mountain nor Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you know not. We worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Notice something. When race comes up earlier, he was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. He asked to drink from her cup. Jesus makes no comment. None at all. Just a reality. You're Jew, I'm Samaritan, no comment. But now she brings up race in relationship to Jesus' father, where we worship. Our fathers worship in this mountain. Behind her is Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is where the, the Samaritan temple was located, and that's where we go to church. We go to church at Mount Gerizim. Uh, you people, y'all, y'all go to church over there. Y'all go to church over there. You go to church in Jerusalem. Uh, watch this. We were raised different. Because she says our father. Our fathers. That's how you were raised. Jesus, let me explain this. My daddy told me. And when you want to get close to God, you, you, go, you go back here to Gersia. And my daddy told me that because my granddaddy told my daddy who told me that this is God's way. And the only reason my granddaddy told my daddy who told me is because my great granddaddy told my granddaddy who told my, grand, my daddy who told me that this is how we live. This is how we worship. This is our view of God. This thing has been passed down from my father's. It's part of my history. It's part of my heritage. It's part of my background. It's how I was raised. And you people, the only reason you do what you do is because your daddy told you, because your granddaddy told your daddy who told you, and your great-granddaddy told your granddaddy who told your daddy who told you. We got two different histories. We got two different backgrounds. We were raised on different sides of the track, Jesus. We're different. When she brought up race the first time, Jesus had nothing to say. But when she brought his daddy into it, he gives her a whole lecture. We can have our racial differences, lady, but when you bring my father into the discussion, I got to clarify. And boy, does he clarify. You worship what you know not. Your daddy was wrong, your granddaddy was wrong, your great-granddaddy was wrong, and your great-great-granddaddy was wrong. All your people are wrong. They're all wrong. Because they're not worshiping correctly, they're not worshiping the true God. You are following a tradition passed down by your parents, passed down by your race, and all of them are wrong. When you bring my father into the equation. Because theology must rule anthropology and sociology and all the other ologies. You're, you're, you're wrong. Because when you bring my father into it, it has to have two qualifications, spirit and truth. It's got to be the right heart, spirit. It's got to emanate from the right motivation. And truth, it must, it must operate on an objective standard. Oh, here's our problem. We are operating on illegitimate standards that are not rooted in God, rooted in culture, rooted in history, rooted in background. 
And all of that may be facts. But the question we must ask is, is it the truth? Because you can have facts and it not be the truth. Your information could be accurate and it not be the truth. Because the truth is an objective standard by which reality is measured. It's God's point of view on any subject. So just because you were raised a certain way, once how you were raised disagrees with what God says, how you were raised was wrong. And I'm talking about your mama and your daddy. I'm playing the dozens on you. And the problem is people reach back in their history to legitimize their decisions today when their decisions today go against the kingdom of God and God himself, but because this is me, this is my background, this is what my daddy told me, this is what my people say. So that goes on forever, year after year, decade after decade, and in our country, 240 years later. It looks like we've made some progress, but then we back up to very little progress because it's rooted in facts that are not necessarily truth. The story I like to, to visit on this is, you can read it sometime, Galatians 2, verse 11 through the end of the chapter. My boy Peter, Peter. Peter was a super Jew. If Peter was a soul singer, his favorite song would be, say it loud, I'm Jew and I'm proud. I mean, he's, he's a super Jew. One day, he's having devotions on his rooftop, and a sheet comes down from heaven with all these unclean animals on them. And God tells him, eat. Peter said, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. That's all unclean. All unclean. God says, don't call unclean what I call clean. I don't care about your background, your history. I don't care about all that. If I call it legit, it's legit whether it's part of your history or not. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to Cornelius' house and I want you to tell him about me and he's a Gentile. I know you, don't, you didn't grow up with Gentiles. You're not used to Gentiles. You don't like Gentiles, but I told you what to do. And so don't you talk about those people like you've been raised to thinking about those people because I just told you from heaven what I want you to do with those people in spite of the background you have. And so Peter obeys. He goes to Cornelius' house in Acts 10 and he, he, he tells them about God and Cornelius and they, they all make a commitment to God. And now it's Jews and Gentiles and they're all Christians and stuff. And Peter discovered something. Then people knew how to cook. <laughs> he, Peter discovered something. He discovered food he knew not of. He discovered pork chops. Because <laughs> he couldn't eat pig. But God, but God told him you can eat anything now. So he discovered hog laws, chitlins, pig feed. <laughs> he, he's discovered this Gentile menu. Huh? He now knows he can have bacon with his eggs now. He, he has discovered, <laughs> he's discovered some some good stuff. So in Galatians 2, Peter is eating with the Gentiles. He's eating, he's, I mean, he's that sweet Georgia Brown. He's eating <laughs> with the Gentiles because he can eat, he can eat pork now. Okay? So he's, he's eating with the Gentiles and, you know, he's sucking on the neck bone. He's, 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 he's just enjoying his pork pig eating self. We're talking pork ribs here. This guy is now eating with the Gentiles, something he would have never done growing up until he ran smack dab into God. While he's eating with the Gentiles, some of his boys from the hood show up. It says some of his Jewish brethren came and saw Peter eating with the Gentiles. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Pete. Wait a minute, Pete. Wait a minute, Pete. Now, and we're going to have to live with them in heaven, but we don't have to hang out with them on earth. This is unacceptable for you to be with them people. They, they, the Bible says 
the circumcision, the Jews who showed up, intimidated Peter so much that Peter got up from his chair and left the Gentiles. It says the rest of the Jews who were with him got up too and walked away from the Gentiles because they didn't want to offend their own race. Peter gets up and he's the leader. The rest get up because a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. See, if our pulpits were right, we would have solved this problem of racism a long time ago. Slavery would have been solved. Jim Crow would have been solved. Segregation would have been solved. All this would have been solved, but because the pulpits were anemic and allowed to take place, the evil in America, we are still fighting that evil today because the pulpits were silent biblically on this issue, maintaining a manifest destiny ideology that was in contrast to biblical theology. But that also explains why the civil rights movement was able to change it because the church got out in front of it. So Peter, Peter gets up, he walks away, and there's another statement made in the story in Galatians 2. It says, even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Oh, not my boy Barney. Anybody but Barney. Why is Barnabas, he's the only name of the group that was there who singled out? Why, you, why do you say even Barnabas? What was so special about Barnabas? Well, when you read the life of Barnabas, he's the encourager. He's the one who, who encouraged folks. He's the one who, who uh, when, when Paul wanted to get rid of John Mark, he says, no, don't get rid of John Mark because he's got potential. And he, he's the guy who's keeping things going, giving you hope. Well, the reason he singled out is because we're told in Scripture Barnabas was born in Cyprus. Cyprus is a Gentile colony of Rome. So he lived with Gentiles, grew up with Gentiles, went to school with Gentiles, played ball with Gentiles. He, he, he grew up in a Gentile environment, so he knew what it was to live with other folk. But that's how bad racism is. It'll make a good man bad. Even Barnabas, not Barney. But to satisfy not offending his own race, he disobeyed God. He'd have probably gotten away with it, except Paul wanted some pig feet too. Because according to Galatians 2, Paul says, when I saw what Peter was doing, I condemned Peter before them all. He acted a fool in public. I, in public, said to Peter, you are embarrassing the truth of the gospel. You're making Jesus Christ look bad. You're, you're, this is not some social decision you made. You have embarrassed Jesus Christ and the good news of the cross, which means he brings people together across racial and cultural lines at the cross. The only qualification you need at the cross is you're a sinner who needs a savior, regardless of your class or your culture, and you have messed with that message. One of my favorite verses of scripture, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, it's Christ who lives in me, the life which I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That great verse, many people don't know, comes at the end of this. We had a guy who came in our church some years ago, and he was noticing more and more Anglos coming to the church, and he was getting a little upset. He said, we're getting more and more Anglos joining our church. I said, yeah. He said, well, you know how they are. I said, what you mean? And well, you know, they got this way of doing things. They're going to try to take over, blah, blah, blah. He went through all this stuff. And I could tell he had some bad experiences maybe. And so, so he, he told me, he says, so I said, well, you better keep winning blacks to Christ so we outnumber. <laughs> he said, well, well, 
I don't know if, if I can stay here. I said, bye. <laughs> it ain't take long. I didn't offer him a seminar, a workshop, a let's get to know each other program. Okay, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he had some negative experiences racially that affected how I was feeling. Good, okay, I understand it. That happens. So we will work with you to deal with that, but what we will not let you do is let your experience control how the Church of Jesus Christ works. And so what we have done is we've allowed culture and color to overrule the faith. And so you got even Christians divided all over the place. Don't know where to stand on issues. Don't know which position to take. That's because you're trying to dissect it culturally and color-wise rather than biblically and spiritually, which would save you a whole lot of time. The Bible says that God be true and every man a liar when they conflict with him. So, so the story thickens as we get to this last section. The woman says, verse 25, I know when Messiah comes, he's called the Christ. When he comes, he's going to make everything all right. Boy, that, doesn't that sound spiritual? <laughs> when Jesus comes, everything's going to get better. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. A lady, I'm already here. I'm already here. You waiting for something that you don't have to wait for. By the way, let me explain something just in case you don't know this. Whatever race you are now will be the race you will be in heaven. Okay? So let, let me get that straight. Whatever race you are now will be the race you are in heaven. You are eternally black. <laughs> you are eternally white. You are eternally Spanish, Indian. You know, you're, whatever you are now will be what you are in heaven. You are intentionally, racially profiled <laughs> by God. John says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, he said, I looked up in heaven, and when I looked in heaven, I saw people from every nation, every tribe, every kindred, and every tongue. He says, I could see the differences among the you. So whatever you are is what you will be. So stop putting that cream on your face. Stop staying out in the sun all day to become something different than you've been made. You have been made that way eternally. So, Remember our disciples? Remember our disciples? Verse 27. At this point, the disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? Now the disciples, you know, they went to get the chicken. They come back, and they notice he's speaking with a woman. They're not surprised he's speaking with a female. They've seen Jesus speak to Martha. They've seen Jesus speak to Mary. They've seen Jesus speak to the Syrian Phoenician woman. They've seen the people, Jesus speak to the woman with the issue of blood. They've seen Jesus speak to a lot of females. What's messing with them is he's speaking to a Samaritan female. Which explains why he let them go into town to buy food. He could have never dealt this woman with this woman with these races hanging around. but neither did he let them stop him from doing what he was supposed to do. So just because all your posse isn't right doesn't mean you don't do what's right. Jesus did what's right 
and he told them, I'll catch up with you later. So they come, let me, let me get through this. They come, and, and when they come, the woman runs into town, and she says, verse 29, come see a man who told me all the things I've done. So she goes to the city, and she, 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 she goes to the men of the city in verse 28, so the men of the city are on their way out to check out this Jesus because of the cross-cultural, cross-racial witness of Jesus to this woman. The disciples in the meantime are saying, Rabbi, eat, verse 31, because we went all the way into town. It's about a five-mile trip down, a five-mile trip back. That's a 10-mile trip to bring Jesus some lunch because it's 12 o'clock noon. So they bring Jesus some lunch, and they say, okay, Rabbi, we got your lunch, eat. But Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Say, what? We didn't go on 10 miles and you've already eaten. I can see Peter now. Who fed him? I cut off his ear. Because it goes, it's a 10 mile trip and you've already eaten. Disciples were asking, verse 33, who brought him something to eat? After we didn't go on into town to buy food. And Jesus hits them with, here's the bottom line message. Verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What fills me, satisfies me, is doing the Father's will, not satisfying your racist, socialist, culturalist agenda. And then he says in verse 5, 45, 35, don't say four months and then comes the harvest. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're already white under harvest. Stop putting it off. Don't say, we're going to get around to this four, four months from now. We're going to get around to this later. We'll fix this later. He says, if you'll pay attention and look up, you'll see the fields are already ready. Now, when they looked up, what did they see? They saw all those Samaritan men coming across the field. So what did Jesus do? He set up an opportunity for them to rate, relate to people of different races. He set up a scenario. And that scenario must always be set up by the body of Christ who is to reflect Christ where anybody can come through these doors who respect our faith in Jesus Christ and regardless of history, background, race, or culture, they are welcome in the family of God fully. Because we have a standard. And I love how it closes. Verse 39, from that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word the woman who testified he told me all the things I've done so when the Samaritans came to Jesus they were asking him to stay with them and he stayed there two days did you just did you just hear that wait a minute when we started the woman is shocked he's willing to drink out of her cup a couple of hours later he hanging out on the weekend he stayed with him two days. How do you go from people don't even drink from the same cup to a couple of hours later, why don't you stay with us for the weekend? Because when you do it God's way, it doesn't take that long. That's why. But now it's real easy in here. See, it's, it's real easy in here because, yeah, we can all get along in here. What happens when you go out and you have to face your own race? What happens when you go out when, when, when your biblical view is not the popular view? What happens when, when you're rejected for not being black enough, white enough, red enough, yellow enough, Spanish enough? When, 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 when you have to take that stand responsibly, kindly, in love, but clearly. Because when a lot of folk hear messages on love and unity and all that, it's good inside the house. It's like the story of of the, of the, the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Lone Ranger, Lone, Ranger, Lone Ranger and Tonto are going across the plains and, and a group of Indians, they go to the northern ridge and a group of Indians show up and they're getting ready to attack the Lone Ranger. So Tonto says, 
uh, Kemosabe, what we do now? So the Lone Ranger said, well, we got to go east. So they go east. Now there's a group of Indians on the eastern ridge. They get ready to attack the Lone Ranger and Tonto. So Tonto said, Kemosabe, what we do now? He said, we got to go west. They go west. When they go west, there's this long group of uh, Indians on the western ridge getting ready to attack. So uh, Kemosabe, what we do now? Tonto says, well, there's only one place we can go. We got to go south. So they go south. When they go south, there's a group of ridge, uh, Indians on the southern ridge. And now they're being closed in in four directions by the Indians. So now the Lone Ranger has a question. Lone Ranger said, Tonto, these are your people. <laughs> what we do now? Tonto said, what you mean we, pale face? <laughs> See, folk jump ship when the going gets tough. But what God is looking for are some serious Christians on this issue who start biblically and spiritually and work it down racially, socially, and culturally. You do not start with your culture and work it up. You start with the word and the authority of your faith and work it in. May God help us to do our part locally, personally, in our families, 